is kind of a basic type structure that's found in an artificial reservoir or in a natural lake. It can be a lake like uh, Muskegon, it can have some weeds on it, or it can not have a blade of grass on it. It's a big, wide, sweeping bar. It's got several fingers on it. You're going to see this slide again. The slides you see in these structure situations are going to be considerably different than that long, ridge type bar that you've been looking at. Much of it is going to be like this, okay? Keep going. Keep going. This is that long, wide sweeping bar. Every long, yes it is. That's the long, that's the wide sweeping bar. It could, it, the things that they have in common, whether they're in an artificial reservoir or whether they're in a natural lake, is that they run all the way from the shallows to the deepest water in the lake. You can see it's not a long, slim bar. It covers a lot of area. There's a lot of contour lines there, okay? Shows different depths on a contour map. Five foot contour line, 10 foot, 15, 20. And you can see how far out from shore it comes, okay? This is more of what you'd run into in an artificial reservoir. If you remember our old slide, where the slide you were looking at in the first part of the presentation, it was a long ridge type structure that dropped into the channel or the deep hole and it came up to a steep shore on the other side. This is basically the same slide, except the change. The steep shore is along the shoreline, over to the right here. And the, the blue represents the river channel. And as the river channel comes in toward the shoreline, it creates this steep shore. It begins to swing out into the middle of the reservoir. When it swings out, it forms a long ridge type structure, a long bar. When you get out to the end of this bar, the very end of it, where it swings out, and you can see it, where it says bar out there, the very end of it, it's going to be flat, and it's going to be flat on the top side where it says contour lines. There's no breaks there. There's no abrupt change of depth that takes place there. So if you spend all your time fishing all the way out on the end of this particular bar, you're going to be fishing on a long bar in a reservoir that drops into the channel at about 50 feet in some lakes and about 37 feet in other lakes where the abrupt change in depth is going to take place and possibly where the contour point, the contact point is going to be is where the channel break line mark is. It'll be somewhere in here that the fish will come up. The actual bar itself, the path to the shoreline will be here. The sharp break is, is made by the river channel. The old river that cut into the shoreline and it made these abrupt changes of depth, very steep, along, the, along that, that steep shore, and then as it swung out and went across the reservoir, it created these little short, abrupt changes. There may be fingers on the side of that bar. It could have rocks on it. It could have brush on it. It's the old shoreline is what it is. It's the old shoreline. So we got two basic kind of structures there, a big, wide, sweeping bar, that could be in the reservoir, that was a slide you saw prior to this, or it could, uh, uh, it, it could be in a natural lake, but this one here would pertain to a reservoir. The breaks, if north is straight up, of course west is to the left, the breaks are gonna occur on the south side of the bar as you look at this. The fish are gonna come up somewhere on the south side of the bar, not on the north side. Your mapping and interpretation is going to tell you this. You have to be able to do this in order to hit this school of fish, especially the big bass. If you can't identify this, chances are you're never going to do it. You've got to know where the abrupt change of depth takes place. When you look at something like this, and you're in an artificial reservoir, you don't leave the dock and turn the depth finder on and start looking for something because you're going to be looking for a long time. In a natural lake, you say, well, I looked at the contour map, I find the deep holes, and I find out what runs out into the deep holes. And that's true, even on Muskegon, except it's on a larger scale. 
most natural lakes have a certain amount of deep holes, like S Lake over here, got three of them. Whatever runs out into those deep holes, a weed line or a bar, whatever structure situation it happens to be, that's where you're going to find the fish. But in the reservoir, if you're going to go out and look for deep water, you're going to find all kinds of it. There ain't nothing but deep water. Where in the reservoir? Where? So what you can do is observe the shoreline. The shoreline is going to tell you what's there, what you can see with your eyes. Keep your eyes open. When you see that, you see the steep shore to the east. Remember, north is straight up. You see the steep shore to the east. You see this long, ridge-type structure coming out. You see these rocks here to the south then, as we're looking at it, and, and straight out, uh, coming straight out into the lake. Now I'll go back a slide. This is what's under the surface. This is what's there. Oh, go ahead. So when you look at that, you have to know that that's what happened. Just by looking at it with your eyes. You don't even have to turn the depth finder on until you see that. When you see that, I'll go back slide, right? You go out there and you map it and you find out that this is here. Okay, move forward. If you can't do that, then you better somehow find a way where you can because it's what you have to be able to do. Certain things on the shoreline indicate a structure situation. A long ridge running out into the middle of the lake. Feeder creeks coming in. Just go by some of these. Feeder creeks coming into the main channel like that represent a structure situation. Now, if you have any idea and you're looking with your eyes in the reservoir, what's under the water, Take a look at what's up on the shore. What's up on the shore is what's under the water. You say, well, gee, I fish out here in Hess Lake and I never get hung up. Well, when you fish here, you're going to get hung up. But the fish are there also. Those rocks and breaks as they continue down underneath the surface along the long ridge type structure, those are the things the fish are going to pause or stop at. Your lures are banging off of those things. Some guy asked me, he says, well, why can't I do the same thing with a crankbait, a plastic one? Go ahead and troll it over that stuff and say it'll be running on its back by the time it comes up again. You gotta have a tool that's indestructible. The spoon plug, it's indestructible. It'll bounce off all that stuff. It'll get hung up under stuff. We all know that. Go ahead, that's the same slide. We have to look at a reservoir and this would even be like Mona, which is a reservoir. You have to look at a reservoir like there's no water in the reservoir. There's only the old river channel. You have to be able to identify the structure situations that are running out into that river channel. And some of them are going to be pretty hard. Some of them you've never seen before. And you're going to see flashes of it. Like I said, I'm not going to keep you here all night. That's the look that you want to have, something with no water in it except the old channel. On the steep shores, you could be fishing in a reservoir or a section of a reservoir where you're in a canyon. That means there's steep shores on both sides of you. You shouldn't be in there, but maybe you get yourself stuck in there. There's nowhere to fish. What do you do? Do you troll all those steep shores, both sides, for miles and miles? No. You ride down the reservoir and you look at the steep shore. You're coming down this side right now. All right, you're on the, you're on the uh, north side of the reservoir. You're coming down the shoreline. That finder's turned off. You know there's 80 feet of water off that steep shore. What do you look for? You look toward the rock and toward the steep shore and you look for the dirt. The dirt tells you that there's a wash or a slide. The water washed everything down in that reservoir. What it did is it formed a little short bar. Those washes or slides could be a mile or two miles or six miles apart. But you saw it with your eyes, not with the depth finder. You'll look forever with the depth finder. Now, when you spot the wash, you can go over there and use the depth finder as an aid to tell you how far out it comes, at what depth does it break, what lure you're going to have to use to hit it. Same slide. This is what it would look like. As you look at the shoreline, you can see the wash or slide. Again, there's a cave-in. You can see the cave-in. 
You can see the high hill where everything caved in and washed down into the lake. Well, there'll be some hangs there, too, you can bet on that. But this made the structure situation on the steep shore. The washer slide, you look for the dirt. This is, this is a saddles. This has always been a big problem. You know, when is the saddle good? When is the saddle bad? When can the saddle be the sanctuary? Can the saddle ever be the sanctuary? If there's adequate depth between the island and the point, the saddle could be the sanctuary. If there's 30, 35 feet of water, the water color's good, the saddle could be the sanctuary. If the island is far enough from the point, there could be two schools of fish, one that moved toward the island and one that moved toward the point. If the saddle is shallow, if there's less than 20 feet of water in there, and there's deeper water available on either side of the saddle, the saddle will not be the home of the fish. The fish will be off to the side somewhere, but the saddle has to be checked by trolling. This is, a, this is a saddle, this is a low water condition. You can see the saddle right here. You can see the island, the island is to the east, the point or shore is to the west. This is that low pool, low water. When that water comes up, you can see where the old water line is, you can see where the saddle is. That's what it would look like on low water condition. That's what you have to picture the saddle looks like underneath the water. You have to look at it in your mind that that's what it looks like. There's what it looks like when the, when the lake is full. There's the island to the west, and there's the point to the east. And you have to assume or go check to see if there's a saddle and what depth the saddle occurs. In an island, you see the flow here. The flow is from west to, west to east. It shows the channel flow. Which side of the island are you most likely to find a long, ridge-type structure that should contain the fish? It'll be the downstream side. Why? Because the water washes that downstream side. If there's some breaks, like what you see, brush, etc., rocks on the end of the bar, that's a break on the bar. They don't necessarily come up exactly on the end of that downstream side. That could be rather smooth. The sharper breaks are on the side where the water has kept cutting into the into the, the part of the island itself and causing some sharp abrupt, abrupt breaks to the deep water. This is what it would look like out on the lake. The upstream side has to be checked too, but that will have a shorter bar. The long ridge type structure will be on the downstream side. That's where you'll find it. That's where the water has washed that long bar. And the fish don't necessarily, I'm going to say it again, they do not necessarily come up on the end of the bar. Going through this. Go. Back then. Go. All right, there. This is what we talked about before. Here's where a lot of spoon pluggers are going wrong because they don't know how to map a bar. They don't know how to use this depth finder. The way they use a depth finder is to run the spoon plugs at a certain depth. They don't know what's really there. They don't take time to map the bar before they fish it. They just go fishing. Consequently, they don't catch too much. Uh, fortunately, trolling the spoon plug around behind the boat is a pretty, pretty productive way, and they catch a few fish. But do they ever really know what the bar looks like? Many of them spend their time, they spend their time trolling around out here off the end of the bar because the slides or the written material in the green book always show the deep water off the end of the bar. Those figures in the green book and in the home study course are in general. <coughs> the abrupt change of depth can take place on the side. The abrupt change of depth on this contour map and what you have to be able to do when you get on the lake occurs at a depth of 15 feet where the lines come close together. There's an abrupt change of depth from 15 to 30 feet. That is where the fish come up. 
if the guy makes a bad pass and catches a five pound bass, what he thinks is a bad pass, he runs up on the side of the bar, runs up too shallow because he didn't know it swings out. Then he anchors on the end of the bar and casts straight out into the lake. He says, I can never catch him on the cast. That's because you don't know where they're coming up. You don't know where you caught them. Many times, more often than not, the contact point and the abrupt change of depth in a reservoir or a natural lake and where you're going to catch the fish is going to be on the side rather than right off the end. It's going to be on the side. And you have to know how to determine that. Go out there and determine it ahead of time by mapping the bar. You don't map the bar with a lure in the water. You map the bar with the depth finder without the lure. Now, when you put the lure in the water, it's the final mapping tool. It teaches you several things. It teaches you if the bottom is hard, soft, if there's rocks, if there's weeds, if there's muck, if there's moss, and it also finds a fish for you. So the lure is the final mapping tool. In the old days, we used to have to just use the lure to map. We had no depth finder. The lure and markers and an anchor rope with a knot tied every three feet, so we knew how deep the water was off the end of the bar. You don't have to do this. You can use the depth finder as an aid, but don't try to map the bar with a lure in the water. Yeah, that's good, Rock. That, uh, this is the uneven contours of the wide sweeping bar. Now here's a bar that you can turn the corner on when you contour it. Why? It's not long and skinny like from one end of this concrete to the other. It's a big wide sweeping bar that reaches from the edge of that pier out there all the way to those, those cars over there in the parking lot. Big wide sweeping bar. Now what do you have to know about that one? You have to identify several projections on the bar or fingers, how many are on the bar. You run the drop off, you run the abrupt change of depth with the depth finder and note the depths. I said depths, not depth. The depths where an abrupt change takes place. This is what we mean. There's an abrupt change. There's a five foot break from 16 to 21 feet on one finger. There's an abrupt change of depth from 19 to 24 feet on the next finger. There's an abrupt change of depth from 12 to 16 feet on the next finger. An abrupt change of depth from 6 to 12 feet on the next one as it swings into shore. The break line, the abrupt change of depth does not ever and never is at the same depth all the way around the wide sweeping bar. It changes. So you can't say it's going to be at 13 feet all the way around. You don't even have hardly 13 feet of water as you get near the shoreline. So you have to identify it. You've got to be able to do this. All right, now, what finger should produce the fish? What finger should be the contact point? It should be the one that breaks into the deepest water in the lake. It's very easy to see that at 19 feet, that one finger breaks down into the deepest water in the lake. There's shallower water to either side. Now, some people look at that and they say, well, the reason that's a contact point is because it's got the deepest break. That's not so. That break could be from 12 to 24 feet and break into the deepest water in the lake, and that would still be the contact point. It doesn't have to be the deepest break on the bar, and it very seldom is the deepest break. There may be a deeper break out further, but the drop-off, the first abrupt change of depth that occurs on the wide sweeping bar is the break line that you're interested in. You'll find the secondary breaks, the deeper ones as you go along, okay? So that doesn't have to be 19 feet. That could be 12 feet or 11 feet or 16 feet. It does not have to be the deepest break on the bar. We're using your eyes in the natural lake when you see something like this. You know, we got something like this in Lake Mona. Um, I'm on the, I forget the south end of the lake, whatever it is. A big long peninsula runs out there and that indicates that there's a situation, a structure situation. You looked at that with your eyes. You saw it out there, so you go over there. You can't bend a nose in a depth finder looking like that. You run right up on the shore. You see something like this? There's a structure situation. Keep moving through these. Okay? Now in a reservoir, we have this kind of a thing. 
where the channel splits. Every time the channel splits, it forms a bar. Where it splits, it makes a structure situation. It forms a bar. When you go back in some creek arms, it will split again, figure two. As, as, as it splits and it goes back in the creek, there's the creek channel in figure two, it will split again. There will be another structure situation. And the creek arms in some reservoirs are very deep and very large. So that's every time the channel splits, you're gonna see a structure situation. Okay, you can see the channel split right here. We got one main channel on this side, and the creek channel on the other side. You see that long ridge sticking out there, that continues under the surface. This is what it would look like. The channel splits, you can see the bar right where the channel splits. That's what it looks like if there was no water in that reservoir except for the creek channel or river channel. Okay. Same thing here. Now this is where a lot of problems occur, but not as serious as some of the ones that are gonna follow, all right? In a lot, of, a lot of reservoirs, lowland type reservoirs or flatland type reservoirs, we have what we call feeder cuts. Usually they're pretty easy to identify here because the bars come right off the shoreline and they might run out from here to that boat over there, which would be a long bar. They're very easy to identify. And the feeder cuts are the path to the shoreline for the school of bass, for instance. Uh, they won't move over a flat. They won't move from the boat to where I'm standing unless they got a path. Why do they have to have a path to the shoreline? Anybody ever wonder why he says they have to have a path to the shoreline? They won't move over a flat, he says, and they have to have a path. The reason they have to have the path to the shoreline is so they can get up in the shallows to spawn. If there's no path, they won't be there. There'll be no fish. There'll be no bass. Mosquitoes are going to get us, I'll tell you. As you get out in some bigger lowland type reservoirs, or even flatland type reservoirs, you begin to move out further and further from shore. This becomes a little bit more difficult, but still in all, you're able to see the feeder cuts and things like that from the boat to indicate that you, as you come along that channel break line, you can see things on the shoreline that indicate that those fish are gonna be there, okay? Um, the contact points are gonna be on the upstream and downstream side of that, that channel, right where the feeder cut merges in with the main channel. And these things are getting worse and worse and worse. So I'm going to tell you what, we're going to call this off in a few minutes. Hello, Chase. No, it stinks. More. There. This is what, no, no. This is what occurs in Lake Chickamauga and the TBA system and, and in all those lakes down there. You've got these side feeder stream cuts that can be three quarters of a mile out in the lake. You have to be able to run that brake line that channel break line and identify that feeder cut. You may not be able to see any indication of it on the shoreline. You're too far from shore. You have to be able to do it with the depth finder. As Frank used to say, if you're gonna run the channel break line at 18 feet, I, I believe Frank said it ran all the way from Chattanooga to Knoxville. It dropped off at 18 feet. Where along the 18 feet? 18 feet isn't good enough. It has to be where something happens. In this case, it's a feeder cut. And the feeder cut is the path to the shallows for the bass. In the pre-spawn, those shallow bars up there can become very, very productive. As the bass move up that feeder cut prior to spawning, and then as they move back out again. But the, the real contact points are gonna be where the main channel and the feeder cut connect. Those will be the real contact points. These are the slides that I wanted to show you. I wanted you to see these slides because they, they really explain some things. They explain that the end of the bars can be flat. The end of the bar is not necessarily the contact point. You ha and the second point I want to make is you have to be able to map and interpret the structure or you're never going to be a real spoon player. You're going to be a guy who drags a lure around behind the boat. Well, you'll get some fish, but you won't be able to achieve what's in that home study course. What's in that home study course in that green book will seem so distant to you that, ah, that can't be done anyway. It can with this kind of knowledge. 
Okay? So these bugs are getting pretty bad right now. So we're going to get out of here. I want to thank you for coming. And I'll be around the campground just a little while here. I'll be back the next couple of days, okay? So I'll talk to you then.